Leave now. Life is short. Time is luck. Time changes everything. Our thoughts, our feelings, and the world we inhabit are in constant flux. With the finite time we are given, it is important that as a collective, we continue to reevaluate our relationship to the world and the many things that occupy it. What do you mean the wrong time? Maybe God made me a painter for people who aren't born yet. In life, Van Gogh was a misunderstood genius. Unpleasant. Ugly. While he started to attract some attention in the last year of his life, it wasn't until the work of his sister-in-law in the subsequent years after his death that he achieved widespread commercial and critical success. You're confusing yourself with your paintings. I am my paintings. The world is a tough place for any true visionaries, as their truth of the world is one in which others are blind to. As Nietzsche once said, the greatest events and thoughts, but the greatest thoughts are the greatest events, are comprehended last. For example... Hello hell, do you read me? Upon initial release, many of Kubrick's films were controversial and received mixed reviews, including A Clockwork Orange, The Shining, Barry Lyndon, and 2001 A Space Odyssey. I'm sorry Dave, I'm afraid I can't do that. A more recent and famous example of a film that initially polarised critics and audiences alike was Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me, directed by David Lynch. We live inside a dream. However, the film is now considered to be one of Lynch's best and one of the greatest films of the 90s, further reaffirming the immense importance of reappraisals. How do you manage? If I've done everything that I know I should have done, mm -hmm. and have done it as well as I can do it, mm -hmm. then there's no anxiety no. about turning it over. When I haven't, it's, it's a nightmare. Mm. With a career spanning over 50 years and counting, there are few filmmakers quite as legendary as Michael Mann. Initially, he showed little interest in cinema until he saw Dr. Strangelove as part of a college course. And um, uh, Dr. Strangelove came out in 1963, right. and um, it was a revelation of sorts. It was uh, because it, aside from being a great film and stunning, uh, it it revealed to me that you could make you could make film and um, have a uh, completely independent uh, piece of content that you generated yourself and still be uh, part of mass media, mass communication, and impact lots of people. Throughout his career, Mann has amassed an extensive and diverse body of work, ranging from his early days working on documentaries and TV, to biopics, historical epics, and even a Freudian fairy tale on the nature of fascism. I will consume their lives. Undoubtedly, however, his most significant contribution to cinema has been found within the crime genre. Man is completely at home here, as his vision of the world is so deeply entrenched in reality. He is notorious for his extensive research and planning, something that he established in his very first film, Thief. Instead of referencing other cinematic depictions of thieves, Man instead opted to consult with actual former professional burglars in order to depict the technical scenes as accurately as possible, as well as cast many of them on screen in contradictory roles. The realism comes from just kind of, uh, you know, doing the work. I, 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 uh, I'm excited about doing a kind of immersive research. If I'm going to do a movie about a thief, I don't go look at other movies about thieves or read books about thieves. I go and I go hang with a thief. And, and, and just getting with the real people who really do do this, whatever it is the subject of the movie's about, um, is, you know, you just, you, you know, it's nothing like it. In fact, I can't imagine anybody, why would anybody want to do it any other way, you know? With its neon-soaked skies and synth-infused score courtesy of Tangerine Dream, Thief perfectly introduced us to so many of man's signature trademarks. The film has aged wonderfully, and has since established itself as one of the most important heist films ever made, 
going on to influence more contemporary neo-noir films such as 2011's Drive. I don't sit in while you're running it down. I don't carry a gun. I drive. Despite Thief's enormous influence and impact, there is no film in Michael Mann's filmography that has influenced culture more than 1995's Heat. While they had previously appeared together in The Godfather Part 2, Heat marked the very first time that De Niro and Al Pacino were seen on screen together. I don't know how to do anything else. Neither do I. Heat also served as an enormous inspiration to The Dark Knight. Whether it's Gotham, the heist, or the interrogation scene, it is clear that The Dark Knight owes a great debt to Heat and Michael Mann. No. No, you. You complete. Me. One of the remarkable feats of Heat is that not only has it influenced many subsequent films and filmmakers, but it has also transcended the medium and influenced things beyond cinema. Grand Theft Auto and Rockstar Games, for example, are also greatly indebted to Heat, incorporating man's signature style into gameplay mechanics and directly replicating scenes from the film into their games. <laughs> Heat stands not only as man's magnum opus, but also as one of the greatest films ever made. It is the pinnacle of his philosophy and film form, and by dissecting it we can establish all of the key elements that make up a Michael Mann film. My name's Neil. In Collateral, Vincent tells Max a story about a man who died on a train in LA. Okay, right on notice. The final shot of the film ends with the train leaving, and Heat begins with the train arriving and Robert De Niro's character, Neil, stepping into the city. It is an interesting parallel, and one that establishes man's key philosophy of existentialism. Viewing the train as a metaphor for life, both Vincent and Neil will arrive at their respective destinations through their own will and actions. Just as life goes on, so too does a train. Neil is a self-taught thief with a rigid perspective. Through his discipline he avoids all forms of attachment, as attachment would mean deviating from the most practical action. Allow nothing to be in your life that you cannot walk out on in 30 seconds flat if you spot the heat around the corner. On the flip side of Neil you have Hannah played by Al Pacino. Hannah's philosophy is also that of an existentialist, however he does not adopt the same rigidity that Neil does. He is chipped and a little bit high all the time. She got out. Great ass! Being a cop is a dark profession. The job erodes away at Hannah's relationships and he is currently in his third marriage. Similar to Will in Manhunter, Hannah becomes increasingly lost in the criminal mentality of those he's chasing. To catch a thief, you have to think like one, and as they say, the line is very thin. Hannah knows and feels the negative repercussions of the job, but he also finds solace in that world. He is a hunter who operates in the now, addicted to the chase and not the destination. All I am is what I'm going after. The allure of the chase is so strong for Hannah that despite all the negative things he has already caused, he will cause negative things to happen again. Putting aside the brilliance and total embodiment by De Niro and Al Pacino in their respective roles, what makes both Neil and Hannah so compelling is their depth. Whether you're a cop or a robber, everyone has a life outside of their profession, and man takes full advantage of exploring this side of their life. Seeing the inner workings of the interpersonal relationships of both Neil and Hannah, and how they compare adds another layer of moral ambiguity to already complex characters. I know life is short. Whatever time you get is luck. Outside of the characters of Neil and Hannah and their existentialism, there is the very real character of Los Angeles. Being the entertainment capital of the world, LA is a dreamlike city with seemingly limitless possibilities. However, man's depiction of LA stands in stark contrast to this, with heat and collateral exploring the dark underbelly of the city. 17 million people, this is a country, the fifth biggest economy in the world and nobody knows each other. We are all the centre of our own universe, and even in an overcrowded metropolis like LA, both Hannah and Neil are alone. I'm alone, I am not lonely. 
Parking lots stand empty by day, and by night so do restaurants as everyone goes about their business. The film's very grey and blue colour palette enforces this state of loneliness, covering the world and its respective characters in a sea of solitude. Being social beings, the state of being alone is one that we cannot permanently adopt. Despite operating on completely opposite sides of the law, both Neil and Hannah have great respect for each other. I am never going back. During the sit-down, there is a sense of communion between the pair. In such a lonely city, they tragically find connection and understanding in one another, but this connection does not prevent them from honouring their respective codes. Brother. You are going down. Another important factor found in Heat and any of Michael Mann's films is his depiction of institutions. But the other part of it is that I am political. I've always been political. Yes. And so that the, the world of, of working people and how life is mm -hmm. is something that I'm fascinated by and feel strongly about. Man understands the fundamental nature of institutions and how dehumanising they are. Roger. When you become a cop, you become a tool of the state and a slave to their will. You carry out your orders because you are told to do so, and not always in the name of justice. You have to adopt the mentality of the criminals you are chasing, and in the process you begin to lose your humanity. As a result of the state, not only does the cop suffer, but so too does wider human society. On the other side is the prison system, which is an even more dehumanising institution. In such a harsh environment, the only way to survive is to become less human. As an individual serves more and more time, they become more and more animalistic. To top it all off, society makes it near impossible for criminals to reintegrate after prison life, which in turn leads them back to crime. It is a vicious and never-ending cycle. Give me a hard time, I'll report you loaded, drunk or stealing, and I will violate you back so fast you have a spin. And then there are the banks and financial institutions, which Mann explores in several of his works. We want to hurt no one. We're here for the bank's money, not your money. Your money is insured by the federal government, you're not going to lose a dime. Do I even need to elaborate here? I think we're all aware of the banks and their detrimental effects on us all. <laughs> I don't even burn people. I don't burn people. No. Well, they're in banks are chilling everybody all the time anyway. For all of Heat's remarkable character work and world building, I haven't even mentioned one of its biggest achievements, and that is its action. While all the set pieces are incredible, the undeniable standout is the bank heist, which is masterfully choreographed and shot. To establish space, Mann initially opts for the use of wide shots before switching to medium shots as Hannah and Neil converge. Close-ups are used to showcase character emotion and their state of mind, and wide shots are increasingly used as the fight increases in scope and physical distance. Through his precise choice of angles, we are not simply spectators in this shootout, but rather we are part of it. Then we have the use of handheld cinematography and quick cuts, which add to the highly chaotic and kinetic energy of the scene. It's absolutely masterful directing, and I think Man is one of only a handful of directors that could ever pull off an action scene of this scale. Following Heat, Man would go on to direct the brilliant and critically acclaimed The Insider, before diving further into biographical territory for 2001's Ali. Ali is significant in Mann's filmography, as it was here that he started experimenting with digital cameras for the first time, before going even further in collateral. Yeah. Tell you the truth, whenever I'm here, I can't wait to leave. While collateral's big interior scenes and all-day exterior scenes were shot on 35mm, the bulk of collateral was shot digitally and would mark the start of a new era for Mann in the ever-evolving and increasingly digital film industry. <laughs> Red light, Max. Hold on, hold on. Ever since the beginning of his career, Mann has always been a nocturnal director. Whether it's Thief, Manhunter, or Heat, the nighttime is Mann at his most atmospheric. And now, due to digital cameras, he could go even deeper. Huh? 
Collateral's entire story takes place over a single night, which allowed man to really test the limits of this new technology. The scene on the 14th floor, for example, used basically no lighting, creating silhouettes against the backdrop of LA. It's an incredible sequence that reduces content to shape, and reaffirms the nihilistic philosophy of Vincent. Millions of galaxies of hundreds of millions of stars and a speck on one. Many would consider Collateral to be man's last true great film, which blends both the old and the new, but this is something I strongly disagree with as his digital era holds some of his absolute greatest films, starting with 2006's Miami Vice. With a notoriously troubled production, dense plotline and poetic visual style, it is little wonder that upon release Miami Vice struggled commercially. As its pixelated backdrops suggest, the world of Miami Vice is in a state of constant dissolve and change. In such a world we find our characters struggling with their identity, and building their lives around what is, and not what could be. And it has no future. That's right. Man was never interested in using digital technology to replicate film. He instead understood the unique and singular aesthetic that could be derived from such technology and leaned into it, with breathtaking results. Miami Vice represents the absolute pinnacle of digital photography, a high budget art piece that resembles the visual poetry and sensuality of Wong Kar Wai more than it does your standard police procedural. While its brilliance was initially missed by most, Miami Vice's stature has only continued to increase and it is yet another case of why reappraisals are so important. Look right now. A film that has yet to be reappraised, however, is one that shares a lot in common with Miami Vice, one that I believe is even greater. The critical and commercial reception of Miami Vice seems somewhat tame compared to that of Black Hat. The film holds abysmal scores on review sites and was a box office bomb, grossing a meagre $19.7 million against a budget of $70 million. Uh, the thing about the cyber world was that, for me, it was a revelation. Um, you know, I, like most people, walked around thinking that I live in my own private world and I, I can control the access and egress of other things into it and close the door when I want and keep things out. and then, the veil is lifted and you realise that's not your life at all, it's not any of our lives and it's never going to be the same again. And yet despite all of this, Black Hat to me is a remarkable piece of cinema and one of man's greatest ever achievements. With his first fully digitally shot film, Black Hat expands on the mood based and atmospheric storytelling found within Miami Vice, while reimagining his lifelong thematic interests. Opening with images of a clouded earth, man boldly establishes the interconnected exoskeleton that now surrounds our world. Where Public Enemies deals with the birth of the FBI and surveillance, Black Hat instead deals with the eventual consequences of this, and the total death of privacy and secrets. It doesn't matter whether you're in LA or Hong Kong, someone is always watching. <laughs> One of the ways man visually illustrates this is via the large billboards that surround the apartment in Hong Kong. Billboards that are deliberate in placement and required planning permission to erect. But Black Cat isn't just concerned with mass surveillance, it is also concerned with human beings and how we navigate this new virtual grid. Chris Hemsworth plays Hathaway, a convicted computer hacker who defies all stereotypes and seeks to correct his prior mistakes. <laughs> It's incredibly fitting that man, an individual on the forefront of technological innovation and a firm believer in existentialism, would be forced to reassess his relationship with both in Black Hat. There is nothing in recent memory that has affected society in our daily lives more than technology, and the situation is continually evolving. Since Black Hat's release, we now have further concerns with cybersecurity, automation and of course AI, and its potential effects on wider society. In this irreversibly virtual world, the notion of finding one's individual purpose and meaning in life does look much different. Sometimes I wake up in the morning and I don't even know who I am. Where I am. In what country. 
We have become lost in this world of ones and zeros, in this facade of permanence, while our own impermanent existence slowly fades away. Institutions continue to dehumanise, but under the veil of the virtual world, they now do so with impunity. It is clear that to them, we are just numbers, all of us as expendable and insignificant as a line of code. Listen, we gotta grieve later, okay? We have to survive. Can they get to the next stop before the train? Yet despite its dark and dystopian underpinnings, Black Cat is one of man's most optimistic and romantic works. Paired alongside Hemsworth is the magnificent Tang Wei in her first English language film. She plays Chen Lien, a network engineer whose on-screen charisma and beauty remain unrivaled. I believe you're a very strong man, very smart man. Chen Lien is a source of hope for Hathaway, a light in a dark world. In contrast to Neil in Heat who rejects his attachment to Edie, Hathaway embraces his attachment to Chen Lien. You okay? Even though he can no longer escape the shackles of capitalism and his freedoms have dissipated, she reminds him that in this intangible world, tangibility has never been more important. I've rarely seen her happier. What matters most now and always will are human beings and the physical world. It's not about zeros or ones or code. The virtual world is an extension and not a replacement. I know you. You're about money because it's your scoreboard in the virtual world. There is far more to us than just being another number and we are all one big family. Do you think of yourself Chinese or do you ever think of yourself as North American? You, you, you know what I want to think of myself? As a human being. Because, I mean, I don't want to sound like, you know, as Confucius say, but under the sky, under the heaven, man, there is but one family. It just so happened, man, that people are different. Black Cat was a film so far ahead of its time and so thematically rich that I cannot recommend it enough. I believe if the film were released today, it would be received completely differently, and it makes me sad to see an artist as brilliant and hardworking as Michael Mann be treated so poorly, not just with Black Cat but throughout his career beyond Collateral. However, I also believe that time will be luck when it comes to Mann's recent filmography. Time is luck. and he will be remembered as one of the greatest visionary directors in the history of the medium. Does being 79 push you to work harder, or do you not think at all about age? It pushes to be more careful about what I'm going to dedicate my time to, and I'm somewhat successful, not 100% successful in that. In that. <laughs>